In the first reading today, as we hear about these things that occurred in the life of Job, it's enough to make your blood boil. It's so unjust. And you look at what's going on, you say, how can God allow this? This is horrible. Job was upright. He didn't do anything wrong. And all these bad things happened. We even have to laugh when I hear the words that are in the responsorial psalm. Though you test my heart, searching at night, though you try me by fire, you shall find no malice in me. Can any one of us actually say that? I have my doubts. But Job was an innocent man, a righteous man, but not perfect. And so, because of his holiness, the test that he was given was more profound than what most people will ever have to endure. If God is calling you, for instance, to be an extraordinarily holy saint, yeah, you might have to go through things like that. Most of us probably will not. So we ask ourselves, what is this all about? Why? Well, first of all, we have to be able to look at the situation. You've got the vile creature coming along and saying, ah, Just do something and he'll blaspheme you to your face. Remember the word Satan means the accuser. That's what his task is. He's the highest of the angels, but he was also intended from the beginning to be the one who would place temptation in a good way. You say, well, how can temptation be good? We all have to be tested. We all have to be able to show God that we really mean what we say. We say that, oh yeah, I want to live a good life, I want to be holy, I want to do the right stuff. But then when push comes to shove, do we really do it? On top of that, it's the only way that we grow in strength. If there was no temptation, we would get soft because we don't have to fight for virtue. And so we have to keep working to build up the virtue. And it just grows little by little by little by little. And so there are lots of opportunities that God gives to us to be able to grow. And those come through the temptations and the struggles in our lives. If you look at it that way, God actually uses Satan against Satan's own self. The very thing that Satan's trying to do to destroy us is what is going to strengthen us and make us saints and ultimately destroy Satan. So you've got that aspect of it. You've got this other part and you look at it and say, why would God give in to anything that Satan wants? This doesn't even make sense. The vile creature rejected God and his plan, and and now God's going to actually allow Satan any kind of freedom in this way? What, What are we doing? There's a line in St. John of the Cross which is very, very frustrating. And it says, God allows this as a matter of justice. Like, justice for Satan? What are we talking about? Not justice for Satan justice for you and me. Because on the day of judgment, Satan is not going to be able to stand next to you and look at God and say to you, you didn't give me a fair chance. You gave this person so many graces, exactly what Satan's saying here about Job. You gave this person so many graces, there was no possible way that they could have turned against you. There was no way that they could have done anything other. And God's going to be able to look at Satan and say, you had every possibility to be able to trip this person up and instead they chose to cooperate with my grace. Now we all know that in our lives we haven't always cooperated with God's grace. We're not like Job. I suspect if all these things happen, 
in our lives, we probably wouldn't say, oh, naked I came forth from my mother's womb, naked I'll go back again, the Lord gave, the Lord's taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Would those kind of words come out of your mouth if you found out that all of these horrible things happened? Be bad enough when you hear about just the first things, but then your children all being killed at the same time. How horrible. And still Job never blasphemed the Lord. Would that we would be able to say such a thing about ourselves. But, when again you look at it and say, okay, you see the holiness of this man. That's why the temptations and the purifications were so severe. You will see the same things in some of the great saints because of the holiness that they had and the holiness to which they were called. The things that they had to endure were far, far greater than what most of us will ever have to deal with. But if God is asking you to be a great, great saint, then you're going to have to deal with some of those same sorts of things. But the grace is also going to be there. God isn't just going to throw you out there and say, well, good luck. I'll let you take Satan on by yourself. We can't. Satan is way more intelligent than all of us put together. We're not going to outsmart him. We're not going to outfox him. The saints teach us what to do, and that's to turn to God and trust in him and rely on his strength. The grace is there. Now, as I always like to point out to people, God will give you oftentimes, especially when you're going through purifications, just enough. We'd like to be able to have an abundance, which again would just make it easy. We could look at the temptation and go, pfft. Big deal. Now, if you're going to be tempted so that you grow, you have to use 100% of the virtue that you have already developed in order to get to the next level of virtue. And then if you're going to continue to grow, then you have to use 100% of that in order to grow to the next level. So God is going to require you to do your part and he's going to give you everything else. So the grace is there, but as I was saying, what I, the way I always put it, it's like God is in the passenger seat of your car and he's got the wallet and you're running on empty, fumes basically, but there's a gas station that's right there and so you pull in and he pulls out a $1 bill, it says put in a dollar's worth, like a dollar. <laughs> Gas is three bucks a gallon at this point. You say, yep, here's a buck, put in a buck. It's like, no, I mean, I, I've got a 16-gallon tank. He said, yep, put in one dollar's worth. And so you get one dollar's worth. And as you go down the road, you don't go very far, and you're sputtering again, and you're on fumes just enough to be able to pull into the next gas station. And then he will give you just enough to be able to make it to the next one. And if at some point he says, here's a 20, <laughs> then you better get worried because we'd look at it and go, wow, 20 bucks, I can get at least a quarter of a tank out of that. Yeah, that means you're going out into the desert and there's not a gas station coming for a long time. So rather than saying, oh boy, we, got, we, got, we can go for a ways now, that means, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Just be prepared. Understand how it works. The grace is there, but sometimes just enough to get to where you need to be. So again, do your part. God will take care of the rest. But it doesn't mean he's going to make it easy. He certainly didn't make it easy for Job. He isn't going to make it easy for us either. Because there's no one in heaven who got there by taking the easy way. Remember, Jesus taught us about that. The easy way is wide and smooth and easy. Many there are who are on it, he said, but it leads to perdition. So the way it's going to lead to heaven is rough and narrow. There aren't very many people that are willing to walk it. 
So we have to ask ourselves, is that what I really want? Am I willing to do what's going to be necessary to get on that narrow path, to cooperate with God's grace, to give 100% of my own effort with God's help to be able to grow in holiness, become the saint that he's asking me to be?